Now we have time for questions and answers. If you have any, I'd be pleased. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can medication cause itchiness? I'd love to. Uh, the question was, can medication cause itchiness? Jillian? Sorry? Certainly. Certainly, yes. And sometimes medication can help. Sometimes there are other things that can help with itchiness. But I have had severe itchiness. And I'd much rather have a, stomach, a severe stomach ache than that. It is, it's a horrible thing to have for any length of time. Yes, ma'am. I self, how do I offer these books for free? Uh, some people, including my accountant, ask me that on a regular basis. Um, these books are for free. I'll also add, there's on the, the little bookmark, there's another website called navcare.org. And on that website, there are seven books that you can download, actually. Uh, they're PDF um, um, books. And they help people with navigating healthcare and other systems. There's a pocket guide for patients and families. One of them is a binder that helps uh, families put all of the legal stuff in one place, all the financial stuff in one place, all the healthcare stuff in one place. So for people who are easily overwhelmed by all the information that's demanded of them, if they earlier on start collecting this data now before they actually need it, then it's just easy to take out the healthcare piece when you go to a hospital, the financial piece when you go to the bank or to an accountant. I give them out free because I didn't have any. Um, and I. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to live that long, and so I can't take it with me, as they say, and my wife actually supports me in that, which I'm for, very grateful for. Other questions? Yes, sir. I, I thought it was interesting that a lot of the things you talked about, about uh, having all this stuff, it's people looking after themselves. In other words, they don't have a, a, a group or fellowship around them. Yes. And say, oh, I have a need, help me. Yes. One of, the, one of the hopes around the palliative care, philosophy of care, is about that fellowship, that spiritual element. We are hoping that more and more faith communities go back to their roots, which is the roots of taking care of each other and not just saying hi on Sunday or Saturday or Friday night. Um, but they're scared as well, like everybody else. If you don't know what to do, typically you don't do anything. And so what most communities need, faith communities, neighborhoods, is they need an asker, someone who will actually go out and ask people, you know, Harry's not feeling well, he's probably only got a couple of months to live. He's got a dog, you've got a dog. Could you maybe walk Harry's dog at the same time as you walk yours? If you ask a specific question, more people than not will say yes. If you ask a general, you know, Harry's sick, can you help? Oh no, I'm, I'm too busy, man, really. Like I have just, but if you're gonna cook a casserole, people, you don't have to cook a casserole and make two and always bring over casseroles. Fresh fruit, um, healthy drinks, um, salads, like a lot of people just keep bringing over tuna casseroles and they're nice the first week, but after that it loses something. Yeah. There's one group, one of the things they advise is if you live in a neighborhood of houses and most people have a porch, is that you leave the front porch door unlocked so neighbors can come, bring food, leave it on the porch without interrupting the family from quiet time that they might be having with each other. Not everyone who, who's, who's, who wants to be nice needs to talk to you. The other thing is the fewer people that you introduce in someone's life near the end of their life, so the fewer healthcare providers, volunteers, so pick the ones that you really wanna go because every new person that you introduce is yet another person that your loved one has to say goodbye to. And so we wanna restrict so that the, the, we don't wanna replace friends and family, we want to help them. Do. The best thing that a nurse said to me is, Harry, I'm the nurse, you're the son. My job is to let you be the son as much as I can. And that was just a wonderful, wonderful gift. Sir. Um, with regards to yourself, and uh, I do feel for you, um, what type of support was there for you um, as the ones who are left? You know, we are the ones who are feeling the pain the hardest, right? Yes. Yeah. So what type, of, what type of support did you have through that process of, uh, you know, your own support. Where did yeah. you go? Right. I mean, I know where I go, right? Mm -hmm. where, where did you go? And, and what, what, what was your source? The other little quote that you'll find on the side with the, the websites is, nurture relationships above all else. Because the, the best source of support are people either that you already know or new people who are interested in you as a person and who want to help, who want to listen. 
and it's in nurturing that relationship. So one of the things that got me through, especially when my mom was quite ill, physically ill, is I pictured myself in a place like this, helping other people figure out what to do so that they wouldn't have to stand by their mother and not know what to do. That partly helped me through. So the writing and the speaking helped me to know that although it didn't go well with both of my parents as I wished it had, um, what I learned and what I've learned since can help other people not have. So that's one thing. I'm a prayerful person. I don't have a specific religion, but I'm a prayerful person. So my days always end with prayer of, of gratitude, of what was good about today. Some days aren't really good enough, and so I have to borrow from another day. Um, but it still always ends. Before I fall asleep, I've, I've been grateful for something. So that helps. Um, and Jean Vanier, who was Governor General of Canada and one of my heroes, said, when in doubt, seek how to serve. And so when I'm um, most depressed, or most, most unhappy, most in grief, I try to figure out how I can help somebody else without being a burden to them. Because you can be helpful and then sit down, you know, talk for five hours about what your problems are. That's not really the idea. So those are some things. And then music. I play guitar. Well, you know, I'm not going to sing. Uh, so I play guitar and I, I do a lot of hurting tunes from rock and roll when I'm, when I'm down. And the dog upstairs hides. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome. Um, what I found myself to see are the tips you have to, uh, to help with this type of situation. Where you have, might have a friend or someone you know, who knows is very sick. No one in polls and should we call, should we not call. Right. Um, wondering how they're doing. Um, like to visit, not sure we should or not. Right. Um, so the question is, what tips for when you have a friend who is ill, do you visit, do you call a lot, do you... It's, I'm of the belief um, that I'd rather be slightly burdensome than uh, isolate the person. One of the things I find is because most people don't know what to do, they don't do anything. And so typically I uh, offer to visit. Uh, when I don't hear, I show up. I stay for a very short time. When I get to the door, I change my breathing because I'm quite anxious. So before I knock on the door, ring the bell, I slow down my breathing. So when I enter the room, my heart, when you slow down your breathing, you also slow down your heart rate. And so I'm a calm presence, even though I'm a little on the nervous side. And so I stay for a fairly short time. I sp spend as much time with the family, if they'll let me, as well as to the person I'm visiting, because it's often the family that needs more support at some times than the person themselves. Um, I write fairly regular emails if they're email connected or cards. Uh, no one has ever said, geez, I wish you'd stop sending those cards. Uh, that doesn't happen. So, and I bring food. If they're nearby, I bring food, leave it. I don't always knock. Uh, sometimes I do. If I think the family is struggling with a sense of being overwhelmed, I offer to see if we can help create some kind of circle of support around them. More often than not, they say no, but they appreciate the fact that I've offered. I give them my cell number, which is by my bed day and night. Only one person has ever, of the hundreds I've given it to, has ever called me at three in the morning, and they needed to, which is wonderful. So small things are much bigger than the grandiose, I'm going to come up with a, you know, a float with balloons and stuff and make them happy. Uh, I don't do much of that. Some people do. Some people, you've got to go with the strengths that you have. I, one of my friends was dying in uh, Woodstock, Ontario. And she sent word through her daughter that Harry has to come visit with his guitar. And so I don't get a lot of command performances. Uh, the shower is too small, and so I don't do it very often. But she, she wanted me to come and play for her. So I went to her room, and I started playing soft music, some songs. She didn't ask for any particular song because I wouldn't have known how to play it anyway. I don't have a huge repertoire. But she fell asleep. So my voice was soothing enough in her ears, thank goodness, uh, to give her some time just to relax and just to, to sleep. And so there really aren't, so that's one of the things I can bring. Uh, other people tell jokes better than I do. Other people cook better than I do. Whatever you're good at is what uh, you should bring. Um, and don't do it too much, but the, the reverse is worse. Doing nothing, lying in bed thinking you're going to die in the next week or a month and no one calls is very, very painful, emotionally painful. Yes, ma'am. I think you partially answered that question earlier mm -hmm. when you said, see that person as a whole person. Absolutely. Not as their disease. Absolutely. As 
Yep. Yeah. And it's hard to see some people as whole because we are, we are taught since World War II, before World War II, the natural progression of diseases like cancer was that you got thinner. No big deal, that's what happens at some point, you stop eating as much, you don't drink as much, your body starts to slow down and you get quite gaunt, and that's just a part of nature. After World War II, we started seeing pictures of concentration camp survivors or not survivors. And we started equating falsely that experience to dying of a disease. And that false comparison scared most of my generation, the boomers and younger, because we had never seen someone die naturally at home before. And so we didn't know that it was natural. So we started, we wanted to feed people when they weren't hungry because we wanted them to be happy. Well, at some point you're just not hungry anymore. And at some point you're just not thirsty anymore and that's okay. Trying to feed them makes us feel perhaps better, but it does not help them feel better. Other questions? Oh, come on. Yes, ma'am. Have I ever been to nursing homes and talked to them? One of the first questions I ask when I speak to staff at nursing homes is, how many of you would like to live here? I've had two people raise their hands in the 30 years I've done this. Um, and more importantly, how many of you would recommend your job to your children? And again, very few hands go up. And I said, so that's where you need to start when you think of who you are caring for. The person who is there doesn't want to be here and you don't want your children working with them. So they are already devalued in your eyes and your job is already devalued in the community's eyes. How do you raise the level of support and care in this home to go above both of those so that in fact you are proud of what you do, you can see yourself, imagine a, a type of nursing home where you'd want to live and you'd be proud if one of your children chose to work there. And so that's how I frame my conversation around end of life care, but just care in general. I had a friend who lived for the last 10 years of his life in a nursing home, and it was a step up for him. Joe uh, uh, has g gave me permission to tell the story before he died. Joe grew up with a developmental disability. He couldn't make change in the, in the family store. And so they didn't know what to do with him. This was before we had lots of services. Uh, and so he was sent to Whitby Psychiatric Center for 27 years because he couldn't make change for the family store. And then he was moved into group homes in the community that were worse than Whitby Psych were. And finally he ended up in a nursing home closer to our home um, and it was a step up for him. And one day I asked him, we were driving along in the car, I always ask people questions when they can't get out uh, of the car or we're going for a walk and they can't walk faster than I can. And so when you ask a question out of curiosity and keep quiet, people will tell you the most amazing things. So I said to him one day, I said, Joe, in all the experiences of you, you've had, were you ever suicidal? And Joe was 20 years older than me. He was born a month after Elvis. Uh, that's how I remember. And he looked over at me and he said, I'm not crazy, you know. And so his life, this is a perfect example of what quality of life, why we can't measure quality of life. For him, the joys of his life were smoking and uh, drinking coffee and sitting in coffee shops and watching the world go by. I don't think that that would be enough for me. But in comparison to what he'd experienced before, it was much better because he had the freedom to sit in a coffee shop without someone telling him when he had to be back. And he could come over to our house and have a beer even though he was on some meds and it didn't really affect him all that much. And our dog loved him and licked his face and it was the only not human touch, it was the only um, touch that he got from something else warm. We gave him hugs and stuff, but our dog just kissed his face. The nicotine just drove my dog nuts. And so he just loved licking Joe's face. And so um, we can't measure someone's end of life quality. Uh, that just isn't possible. So he died before he wanted to, because although we had three backup systems in place for the one and a half weeks we were away on vacation one year, he was admitted to hospital the day after we left. They, couldn't, they didn't try to reach the, uh, the, the physician at the long-term care facility. The physician at the long-term care, care facility didn't call the hospital to tell them what was wrong. And so they couldn't treat him without consent, but they did restrain him without consent because we weren't there to tell him to stop. And so there's still a lot of information that we need to to share not only in hospitals and long-term care facilities, but in families, because we don't know what to expect. If 
you don't know what to expect, um, everything's a big, big surprise. Some people say to me, I visited, I was with mom or dad for uh, like days without leaving the room. I go out to go to the bathroom or grab a muffin or something and she dies and that's horrible. And I say, now just imagine closing your eyes for a moment, visualizing all the people who love you sitting around your bed for days watching you breathe and waiting for you to stop. How comforting is that? Not very. So many people actually do wait, as my mother did, until we left the room and there was a nurse with her. That's when she died. It wasn't conscious. She didn't write this down somewhere and say, you guys leave and then I'll die. It's just how it happened. And it happens a lot. Other questions? Um, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. So I'm just curious now, where are you seeing that? What are some of the models that you're seeing? I, uh, the question is whether or not uh, I've seen any trend of people getting together with friends, moving closer together, sharing caregivers, that sort of thing. Uh, there's lots of talk, not a lot of action that I have seen. Some countries like Australia have uh, much better concepts of, of uh, living in space and not. One of the difficulties we have in Canada is every time you get sick, you're moved. And so people don't tell anybody that they're sick because they don't want to move from the first floor to, you know, the eighth floor. And you know what happens on the eighth floor. And then sometime later, you got to go to the tenth floor. And so that is not a good model. So there's much more talk about living in a place until you die and, not, and having the care come to you as opposed to you going out to wherever the care is. So there's some talk of... Um, people uh, buying a couple of condos in the same building together. There's talk of people buying a duplex and having four, like two above, two on the, the bottom kind of thing. I've had those conversations with some of my friends, but as soon as you say, well, so where do we go? They live in Whitby, I live in Scarborough, Pickering is halfway, but it's not really where either one of us has our connections. So what I tell people is wherever you are, wherever you have the most nurturing relationships, that's where you need to stay. Um, my wife is from Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island, which is a wonderful, wonderful community. But people retire there from all over Canada and the U.S. and know no one. And within a couple of years, one of the two die, and that pers the remaining person has no one. It makes no sense to me. Buy a cottage, go up once a, a month or something, but always stay in the community that you've built up over 20, 30, 40, 50 years because that is where you'll get your most support. And the other thing I remind people is to nurture relationships with neighbors. Because as much as our sister, my sister lives in Germany, would want to help me, the neighbor across the street's the one who's going to help feed me. And so we need to nurture those relationships. Those, those of us who are of a certain age, boomers, uh, we need to reach out to younger people in our community who have kids, who may not have a lot of support around raising children. We need to take the kids to the beach if they'll let us or have them come over to the house and do some stuff. We need to build, we need to help those people so at some point, maybe not them because they'll move out, but you build a rapport within a community and people get to know that you are the one that you can go to for some help and maybe now it's time for the community to give back. So there's more of that I think needed than actually physically moving. There are some communities, there's certainly lots of retirement communities and stuff, but again, you can only stay in them for so long and if you get sick, you have to leave. And that's just not a good model of, end of, of the last years of your life, I don't think. Yes? Yeah, what are your thoughts on legalizing the right to die? What are my thoughts on legalizing the right to die? Let me just see how much time I have. I look at this from, and I've actually, one of my books is called Hospice Care or Euthanasia. I look at this from a very practical standpoint. I don't look at it from a religious or moral or ethical standpoint. I look at it from a very practical one. The two systems that we are involved in that are most discriminatory to people um, who are devalued are our healthcare systems and our legal systems. And the two people we want to go to for help in choosing when to die are the healthcare systems and the legal systems. And for some people that makes sense because they're, uh, they are valued in their communities and they will probably get the care and support that they need. Um, I just know too many vulnerable people who would, who would be at great risk. 
So I'm working on a, um, a publication and presenting it in Spain, in Madrid, in Ju June on is there any place for assisted suicide in healthcare? And my argument will be no. Everyone needs to know that when you go to a healthcare practitioner, their only concern is your care. If you would like to have a, the state sanction your death, which is what this law will do, then you will need some controls in place to do that. But we have to remember that everyone has the, has the ability uh, now to refuse treatment, to stop eating, um, to commit suicide or to die by suicide, as uh, many people prefer the, the language to be. Um, and so I'm not arguing against any of those things, but when you want it to be a, a sanctioned act, I can kill myself as easily as I can get someone to help me to die. When it becomes a publicly sanctioned act, then it needs a publicly legal framework in which to provide that support. The person who is, needs to be creative around my pain and symptom control cannot be the person who also knows how to change that prescription to something that's lethal. And from a practical standpoint, economics plays a huge part in this law in the countries where uh, this takes place now. And in Oregon, for example, uh, a number of patients who have asked for payment for treatment for cancer have been told that they cannot, it's too expensive, but Oregon State will pay for their assisted suicide. So when it is an economic, so it's those dangers and people say, yeah, but that would never happen in Canada. So I go back and I go through the history of who are the people who are discriminated most in healthcare. Uh, why are they discriminated against? What does that mean in the way of not being offered treatment or being offered palliative care sooner than somebody else? All of those practical dis considerations need to be looked at before we can give such a broad scope as we'll help someone who has unbearable pain and suffering. Because again, our definitions of what that is change dramatically. After my mother died, I wasn't suicidal, but it wouldn't have taken much more to, for me to become suicidal. That would not have been a good time for me to ask for help. All of that said, I believe within my lifetime, if not soon thereafter, there will be a pill or a series of pills available on the internet um, that will make all of this moot. So that people will just, for whatever reasons, commit suicide. Um, and they won't need anybody's involvement, the healthcare system, the legal system, they'll just do it through their own, they'll get their family to get it off the internet and bring it home. Um, so the, the reason why I'm publishing this next piece is not because I think mine will be the answer, I just want people to be cognizant of what we value now before that magic pill arrives. So that we will put the effort into suicide prevention that we will need at the time that that type of pill becomes available because a lot of people think that they're a burden to their family and talking to lawyers who do estate planning they have a lot of uh, children of elderly people who are fighting over their money before their elders have died and that isn't that isn't rare anymore because you know if you own a house in Toronto it's detached it's a million bucks you know that's worth fighting for why should mom and dad spend that all on long-term care like we need a house too eh? Um, so it's that's the kind of thinking, so that's why I look at the practical aspects of the law. The debate now is over in Canada about pro and con. Now we need to look at how do you uh, apply a new law that minimizes the risks, because people are dying already. They're way over that slippery slope. Uh, the, I, the, the most valued patient in Canada right now typically is male, um, 35 to 55 years old, white, educated, English or French speaking, depending where they live in the country, uh, and fairly well to do. Women typically get less better care, especially cardiac care, you've read a lot about that, obviously poor people. Um, but if you are relatively poor and you are the mother, an Italian mother of 10 children who are now all doctors, lawyers and accountants, your care is going to be exemplary, especially if you're also the head of the hospital uh, volunteer department. <laughs> because then you know everybody in the hospital and they're going to take very good care of you. But it does mean that people who don't have that going for them, who don't speak English well, who aren't very well educated, will die sooner. And that leads me to almost nine o'clock. Thank you so much for your attention and all of your questions.